Hi, everyone. My name is M.G. Heron, and I'm here today with Steve Statham. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. So just a brief intro before we get started. Uh, Steve Statham is a writer of fantastic tales of science fiction and fantasy based in Austin, Texas. He's the author of the Connor Rick science fiction thrillers, the space opera series Gods in the Starways, and other novels. He's also a professional editor of fiction and nonfiction. So I asked you to come here today to talk about gods and science fiction because I read your book, Gods in the City, and we featured it in the SFF book club and people really seem to like it. Um, so what's it, what, is, what is it about the concept of gods that people, especially us writers, are so obsessed with? Well, you know, for a writer, it really opens up your landscape. You can do things that you could not normally do with regular people, it really gives you a lot of possibilities to, you know, really take an idea and run with it. You know, you have gods that have certain abilities. Uh, and so that, you know, for a writer, it really opens up the possibilities. And for a reader, you know, I, I think they like it too. If a writer does his job and uh, writes it correctly, then, you know, the reader will buy into that. Because you know, I really think there's a, uh, you know, you go back virtually every human society from the beginning has some sort of religion, some sort of God story, a uh, small G God, you know, various gods doing, you know, with various attributes. And so it, it speaks to people on a very fundamental level. But for a writer, it, it really lets you take off. And, uh, you know, there, historically, there have been um, certain books that really take that idea and, and just, you know, make fantastic books out of it. I, I brought a couple that uh, probably most people know about, but uh, awesome. Roger Zelazny's Lord of Light. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, won the Hugo way back when. Uh, that's one where, that's a fantastic story where uh, humanity's on a colony world and the Hindu pantheon has been recreated. And wow. you have this Hindu pantheon where they're, they rule too. <laughs> they rule as gods. And then you have this one rogue god that you're following who, uh, you know, and that's the story. And that's one of the well-known ones that really took, you know, the idea of gods and made it, you know, science fiction. Another one, a little more recent, uh, Dan Simmons is Ilium, which mm -hmm. uh, a far, far future earth where there's really only a million or two people left alive, but a, you know, Olympus has basically been recreated and, you know, through technology and everything. And so, you know, and those, these were both enormously popular books. And right. so, you know, if it's done right, it really speaks to people. And for a writer, it's fun. <laughs> you can really take it and run with it. Yeah. That Dan Simmons book, is it in the same series or universe as Hyperion? No, it's not. Oh, it's no, it's not. It's a, it's a separate one. The follow-up of it was called Olympos. So it was oh, a okay. So a different series. Nice. Yes. Yeah. That's cool. I, it's funny, he really likes this concept too. It seems like Dan, because in Hyperion, he uses this concept of, of gods. I forget what the main god is called, but uh, yeah, he uses it in both of his uh, series. Yeah, I mean, the, the Shrike comes across. That's it, yep, you the know, Shrike. As, you know, a god creature. As a god, yeah. yeah. Like an and... unstuck in time god creature. It's this incredible, incredibly unique too. Like you see, um, you know, like the the uh, Greek pantheon of gods, the Roman pantheon, you see them pretty right. often. That uh, Zelazny did the the Hindu pantheon is is very different. You don't often see that, but the Shrike was like on its own level. I don't yes. even know. Yes, created something new. Yeah, that was, absolutely. You know, that was something that you know I was trying to do with you know gods in this sense, trying to create new ones. You know, right. some of them they have you know recognizable god names and attributes, but others I was trying to create you know, something new, you know, so, mm -hmm. and that's, that's part of the fun of discovering for a reader. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. So you mentioned something about how um, throughout human history, we've always had this concept of gods. I've always find it, found it fascinating that every culture, even though they were isolated in the ancient world, like the Mayans had their gods, the, the Europeans had their, you know, many different types of gods. And then Asia had their, and this was before the cultures were really integrated. Why do you think that is that everybody had this concept, even if they didn't necessarily talk to each other? Yeah, it seems to speak to something, you know, just fundamental to humans trying to grasp the larger issues, where we came from, uh, you know, where we're going, you know, why things happen. And, uh, you know, it, it just, 
just seems part of human nature, really, to right. wonder about those things and attribute powers to you know, nature or other beings we can't see. Mm -hmm. And so it just, um, yeah, it's just a, I think it's just a fundamental part of being a human being, you know, totally. throughout time. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, just playing the devil's advocate here, a lot of people think that gods are the, like a fantasy trope or construct, um, and they're often used in fantasy books too, but um, why use gods in science fiction? And, you know, just to give some background on, on gods in the city in particular, and we'll get into talking about that book in, in just a second, but I loved how you used like a science fiction basis for the gods rather than them being like these celestial beings. Yeah, and, and you know, you're not wrong in your observation there that it's, it's almost more of a fantasy trope than science mm -hmm. fiction. But where, you know, the changing point is, is what, I like to look at like Arthur C. Clarke's three rules, you know, one of which is any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. You know, and if you take that a step further, then anyone wielding sufficiently advanced technology could appear as a you know, small g god. You know, yep. and um, and so that's where I was kind of going with this. Um, in that, it's it's a bit of a fantasy trope, but you know, you can make it science fiction, and yeah. you know, if you have a reason for it, and sufficiently advanced technology will give a being powers that you know lesser beings could not comprehend or understand. You know, mm -hmm. it's like if you went back in time four thousand years in a helicopter, <laughs> you know, and with a flamethrower and a cell phone and <laughs> You know, you would be, you know, a god yeah. descending in a fire-breathing chariot, you know, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yes, uh, yes. So, but the, that would be technology. That would be. Right. You know, it's the so. famous story of the, of Cortez and the Aztecs, right? When he arrived and they thought he was a god just because yeah. he had, you know, guns and riding horses. Like armor and riding yeah. horses. Yep. Yeah. Bearded, which yes. was unusual for them. Yeah. And so, and that's, and that's kind of the, you know, the tactic I took in that, uh, the gods in my book, gods in the city and gods in the stars, they're, they were created technologically, uh, you know, so, you know, out of desperation, really, to protect the remnants of humanity after an alien attack. And so as the book goes on, I explain how and why that came about, which was no easy thing. Mm -hmm. But so that's, you know, to separate it from fantasy, that's what I was trying to do. You know, there are right. technological reasons and, you know, basic reasons they were created. You know, of course, as the story takes place, it's a thousand years later, and many of those reasons have been forgotten, you know, so the, you know, the reader discovers them. Yeah, that, I mean, that's another thing that I loved about the book is how you play with time. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, one thing to project from our present moment to 50 years in the future or even 100 years in the future, but to take like a humanity, put them on another world, and then add a thousand years is like a whole nother level. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Gods in the City? Like a, you can give us a book pitch or read the blurb or just describe it. Sure, sure. It's uh, so Gods in the City. It's the uh, first of two books. The second one just came out, released Gods in the Stars. And what it is, it takes place, uh, humanity has been uh, almost completely eradicated by an alien invading force. And, you know, Earth was largely destroyed. Only 4,020 people escaped with the help of some more benevolent, benevolent aliens and found a place far away in the galaxy, a quiet moon where most of you know, what's left of humanity lives in a giant, you know, the city under a dome on a small moon surrounding a gas giant. They're protected by these seven protector gods who were created to protect them. You know, that's, they each have different powers, different abilities, and, you know, that's, you know, that's the setting. This takes place after they've been there a thousand years and mm -hmm. population's grown. People have largely, to, to many of these people, the gods are still almost legendary because the gods aren't around all the time. <laughs> you know, some people, they kind of believe, they kind of don't believe, you know, the gods have their temples and everything and there are worshipers and acolytes, but they don't, um, you know, it's, it's still halfway legendary to these people. And then when an old enemy turns up, well, we see if the gods can protect them or if the people have to step up. And so it's, you know, each book is an individual tale, but the, the story is told over two books. And, you know, that's, that's it. Can these protector gods protect them? Um, and that's the story. Mm -hmm. And um, did, are you planning more books in the series or is the two, is that like the complete story? You know, there, there's room for it. 
there, there's a lot. And when I envisioned it originally, it was two books in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so people who read that will get the main story. But as I finished the second book, it's like, oh, I could, I could take this and run with it. And, you know, there's, you know, there's more room for it. Mm -hmm. so on. I'm considering it. I have another series that's percolating that's next. But <laughs> Nice, nice. That's awesome. So apart from being inspired by like myths and legends, where did the spark for the idea that became Gods in the City come from? Do you remember the no. moment? Yeah, it was, it was an image in my mind of um, a godlike being, which became actually the beginning of the book, really. A godlike mm -hmm. being walking through a city, you know, God made manifest with, you know, a follower, an acolyte. And, you know, I, I took that and it's like, okay, this is a, you know, a, a God that has been created, but it's still, mag you know, he's still magnificent <laughs> and right, walking sure. And I, it was, you know, really from that image in my head, I kind of mm -hmm. built this story. And that became, wow. the woman became Talia, who's the radiant acolyte in yep. Tower's temple. And then Tower was this particular god who's the primary defensive god for the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I took it and ran from that. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that spark, as you say, it was an image that I That's built amazing. a story on. It's amazing. Is that incredible when it just like comes into your head fully formed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then, then you have to figure out all the other reasons for why this is the case, right? Because yes. I'm sure that the image didn't come with all of the underlying motivations and background. You're like, oh, that's an image now. Oh, now I have to do all the work to put it in place. No, that's exactly right. It, it, was, a, it was a very small spark that I managed to make into a, a fire. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and yeah, I was still, you know, putting it together as I went along. Um, sure. you know, the second book, you know, about half the gods are introduced in the first book, you know, in the mm -hmm. second book, there's more of them. And I was still, you know, I didn't have all that mapped out ahead mm -hmm. of time. You know, I was sure. still creating to go along with the story because that's the other thing about writing a story like this. It takes on a life of its own. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you know, you think something is going to be one way and then, no, it'd be better if you did this. And, you know, <laughs> you take it where the story needs to go. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I'll tell you, reading it, I did not get the impression that it was haphazard at all. It all seems very, like, cohesive and, oh. and, and very, like, tight. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So which character in Gods in the City is most similar to you? You know, I, I didn't really write it that way. Um, when I was writing the characters, you know, I had to create personalities for each of the gods. And that's based yeah. on their attributes because they each have a job to do in particular. Mm -hmm. But with the characters, the one thing I, I kind of wanted to get across is they're, you know, they're just regular people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've got to step up and do things they thought they'd never have to do or were never capable of doing. It's almost right. like the, you know, the citizen soldier. <laughs> Look in World War II, you know, these were farm boys who came and they've got a big job to do. Yeah. So the characters I wrote, you know, Talia is, you know, she's an acolyte in the temple, a radiant acolyte. Mick the Fixer works in the subterranean uh, the underworks of the city fixing things that, you know, he doesn't really need to do it because, you know, the God kind of runs the city, but he does it anyway and he still finds things and he's mm -hmm. just a regular kind of working guy. Vance is a guy who, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's got a young family. He, um, you know, he makes custom furnishings and he crafts things with his hand. And, and Vance, <laughs> if, of all of them, Vance is the character you like to think I would be because he's bored out of his mind living in the city you know, under the dome. So he yep. creates, he forms this little organization and they create challenges that, uh, you know, to test themselves. So they're mm -hmm. running and seeking, finding things, you know, affiliation of seekers, you know, they run outside the dome to get things and all this kind of stuff. And so that's when it starts, that's what he is. He's a very mm -hmm. capable guy. He was mm -hmm. capable of more, but he's, you know, he's bored. <laughs> and right. well now, you know, when the bad things happen, well, suddenly he's, he's really got to step up. And, uh, so, I. Uh, <laughs> Not bored anymore. Yes. <laughs> and so I like to think if I was in that living under a dome, you know, where humanity's lived for a thousand years, I'd be trying to find new things to do too. But, mm -hmm. you know, I really wrote them to be regular people who have to step up and, yeah. you know, because the gods can't do everything. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, I really liked Mick the fixer just because of, you know, like his personality. Like he just, even though he doesn't need to fix things, he just feels compelled to do it. And, it, you know, he just wants to, do something with his hands it seems like you know he's just like yeah. uh he's an artisan you know or uh or a mechanic just by nature yes same, yes. With, same yes. with vance i guess he's kind of like an explorer or a warrior sort of archetype right yes yeah with with mick he's he's a regular guy 
You yeah. know, he, he loves finding things and fixing them. That's what he's wanting to do. You know, he's always looking, you know, and he finds things and, you know, he, he, he pines for Talia, you know, he's, uh -huh. he's been in love with her and she's, you know, she's, you know, she's also a character who's, um, she's interested in, you know, her specialty in the temples is, you know, really history. And so she right. knows a little bit more about humanity's past than before, but she loved getting lost in books and history and everything. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, those characters uh, just wanted regular folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. The, the other thing that um, really drove up the believability for me was, um, you know, humanity's on this other planet, a thousand years has passed, but they, when they got there, it was the 4,000 original uh, group of colonizers. And a thousand years later, you know, the focus is really on like family and growing humanity back to uh, better numbers, right? So that they have yes. a better chance to survive. And uh, the believability really came through for me because they were so focused on their families. And, you know, it became where like having kids was like a good thing. Having a lot of kids was a good thing. And they were all interested in, you know, it, even if like Mick and Talia weren't together yet, he was interested in starting a family because that's part of the culture now. So I think yes. part of the believability was that, you know, um, when you projected the culture, you, you changed some things so that it seemed logical. Yeah, and that was, you know, that was a big part of it because, you know, for them, the gods, gods take care of defense. Your job is to rebuild the human race. Right. You know? and, and that is part of the culture. You know, mm -hmm. I think I threw in there some things, you know, day of future generations, you know, was a holiday, things like that. Yeah. And so yeah. like Vance, for example, he's, you know, he's, a, he's married, has four kids, four young kids, and that's the norm, you know, for that, you know, trying to rebuild the human race. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, there is another, uh, another branch of humanity, which is mm -hmm. part of the conflict between the gods, you know, the wandering world, which is a smaller subsect, but in the city, it's still, it's a growing population, you know, doing the best they can with what they got. And that was what I wanted to get across. You know, when a mm -hmm. whole world's been decimated, you need people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I, I haven't had a chance to read Gods and the Stars yet, but do we get to see this other city in that book? It, it, we get to see... Yes, briefly. We don't delve into it, but okay. the god who protects that city, Grey Wolf, um, mm. we learn much more about her and oh, you know where this city is and how she reacts to what's going on. And so, like I say, in, in the second book, the other gods get a much you know bigger presence. Oh. We learn more about Apollo and Apex. Mm -hmm. Apex is building a new world for humanity. That's his role. Oh, you know, he's okay. terraforming a world which my universe, you know, worlds that people can live on are exceedingly rare. You can't find, you know, a planet. Yep. So he is, you know, Apex is building one. And he's mm. very cautious because he's had some failures, you know. Mm. It's a, oh, spoiler alert. But, that, <laughs> and so, yes, we do learn a little more about the wandering world and a lot more about the other gods and mm. some, some additional characters. So Yeah. That's awesome. And um, I don't want to make this sound like it's all like, you know, deep character interpersonal relations. There are also like, there's this epic space battle in the first book. Um, there's a lot of like action too. Um, I know that uh, you gave a reading at a library in Austin that I was lucky enough to be at. And uh, you read the first scene, I think it was from Vance's point of view, where he was like running through the underground. Yes. Um, that's like just a really like intense action scene, even though it's just him running it just like the way that things play out it's uh it's really fast paced i mean when i sat down and read this book it was i, I think it was like three days beginning to end okay well that, that's good i was going for that i was going for a fast pace and you know i mean alien invasion starts oh pretty much immediately <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then yes progresses to you know space battles and in the second book there's a you know it resets the table a little bit and there's a big build up towards you know another so there is uh, exciting there Care, yes, space battles, and that's the fun part. You mm -hmm. know, that's you know, and that's room for imagination to let everything fly to and see mm -hmm. how you know uh, people react. And and also another part that's in the second book that's really big is I I touch on it a little in the first book, but the nature of these aliens, the Otrid, mm -hmm. you know, have it in for us and every other species really. Right. Uh, in the second book, I have a point of view from one of the Otrid characters. Oh, nice as it becomes, you know, moving through the ranks and everything. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to get that because I know in the first book, you know, I, I talk about them, but mm 
but that was some of the feedback. I kind of want to know more about these Otrid. And, yeah. and so, you know, now it's following a character through their society, you know, as he becomes a warrior and everything. And so, yeah. uh, you know, oh. that, you know, it, good, it teaser. <laughs> good teaser. Yeah. That's a great hook. Uh, do you think that there was like a message in gods in the city? What do you want readers to take away from that first and, or even the second book? Well, you know, I, I, I really just hope they're entertained by it. You know, yeah. I, Honestly, I want it to be a fun read. You yeah. know, it's a big, you know, it's, it's kind of a big canvas that's spread out. And, not, you know, I have some fantastic elements in it that I hope entertain them. But I, I did, as I mentioned earlier, I, I did, when I was creating the characters, I, I, I wanted everyday people that have to step up. Mm -hmm. You know, do more than you think that you really can do, more than you're capable of, because you might have to. And you know, suddenly humanity in some circumstances, they find themselves without a God handy and okay, you know, there's probably another wave of <laughs> alien invasion coming. What do we do? And right, right. so that is something I, I, I was trying to emphasize, but really I, as far as messages or anything, I, I want them to be entertained and have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another thing is like, as far as the time scale goes, like you, since the people have been protected by a God for a thousand years, they've kind of lost that, a little bit they've lost that self-defense mechanism that self-defense gene the the fighting yes. gene you might say they very much have they have to rediscover yeah uh, i mean yeah. you know uh, you know there's a character which i don't want to spoil it a character who becomes an admiral have to look up what that means <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know right <laughs> <laughs> you know absolutely and, so, and you know they're studying ancient warfare and everything to try and relearn things and yeah you know f make you know you know, make weapons that are you know, mm -hmm. deep in the archives that, you know, they haven't really had access to, you know, yeah. so have to, you know, they really do have to rediscover those things. Do, do you think that the, like a fighting nature of, of humans, like humans have always been at war or fighting like our whole existence. Do you think that's just like in our nature so much that we can't get rid of it or could it be bred out? You know, I, I think it, it is part of our nature. Um, there's a certain amount of conflict and, you know, when you're, you know, like these characters, when you're put in a place where, you know, you have to start from scratch and rebuild a society, you know, there's not a whole lot of time for that, you know, room for, for that, you know, it's, you know, for centuries, they were, you know, all for one and one for all, because, you know, of course right. we're on a distant moon around a gas giant with just us, yep. you know, but yeah, so they, it, it turns out when it, you know, the instincts do return when they're, when they're needed in these books. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Necessity. So, um, Steve, the SFF book club is all about book recommendations. So, um, I know you brought those two books. Um, do you want to show them again so that if people like the books that you write, I think they'll probably like these ones too, right? Yes. If you're interested in the idea of, you know, gods and science fiction, you know, uh, you know, Lord of Light by Rogers and Lasney. It's a well-known book written in the 60s. I think I won the Hugo in like 67 or something. So it's a well-known book, but it's, you know, for a long time, until really the last year or two, most of Zelazny's books weren't available as e-books. There was a oh, really? issue. Yeah. So if you wanted Zelazny, it's like you pretty much, some of it's still in print, but you pretty much went to half price books to find wow. it. Wow. Yeah. And it's only recently that it's, you know, a lot of his stuff is starting to get out in e-books again. But it's a, Zelazny is one of those authors that I, I hate to see him forgotten. He is so good. Yes. Uh, so much of what he did. So that's one. And then uh, another one, yeah, Dan Simmons, Ilium. Yes. And it's follow up Olympos um, mm -hmm. really tackles that subject of, you know, gods, you know, in science fiction. You know, there are others, you know, there are some ambitious ones that try and, uh, you know, you know, capital G God incorporated into their stories. But right. Yes. But, uh, you know, these I, I recommend uh, for that, you know, if you really like that subject, the idea mm -hmm. of powerful godlike beings in there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you well, said great. other authors? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say that if anybody watching has recommendations, leave them in the comments. People are always looking for good books to read. Um, and, you know, the, the last important thing is, uh, what do you have coming up next and where can people find you? Yeah, they can find me at... Uh, www.stevestatham.com, Steve, S-T-A-T-H-A-M.com. I've got all my books on my website and everything Perfect. with links. Uh, I'm working on uh, the next thing. It's a, it's a series. It's um, 
you know, the opening one, I've got a short story that's 90% done. Uh, the nice. Blade of the Overlord. It's kind of an Overlord series. Oh, that and, sounds fun. Uh, it's uh, sci-fi or fantasy? Oh, it's sci-fi. Yeah, it's oh, nice. space opera sci-fi. Yes. So that's what um, I love writing. That that's you know the stuff that's motivated me. I was always looking when I was reading science fiction for stuff where authors would reach, you know, yeah. reach across the galaxy, reach a million years in the future. Those things, you know, create unbelievable aliens you know that kind of thing right. always pulled me in and so that's um those are the books that inspired me to write this kind of stuff you know I, some of my favorites uh you know peter f hamilton um you know of course dan simmons you know a lot of his stuff the hyperion books we talked about Werner vinge fire upon the deep that book blew my mind when it came out awesome you know that's that's great space opera and uh so those are some cool all right that's great thank you for the recommendations so everybody it's uh stevestatum.com if you want to find steve or just search facebook for steve statum author or something like that yeah uh steve statum books is my facebook steve statum books all right perfect uh and we'll post links in the comments and everything so you guys can find those so thanks for joining us steve i really appreciate it thanks mg for having me yeah. all right appreciate it till next time till next time